Good morning, everyone. Last night after I finished recording the in-depth report, I continued to watch the storms as they erupted in the plains. Many of these storms out of Colorado, coming through parts of Nebraska, hitting Kansas. Watch here again as the animation resets. They got into parts of, of Iowa, Minnesota, and into northern Wisconsin. But many of these storms as they came through uh, produced uh, very distinguished hail signatures on radar. This is where you get into the, the deep radar reflectivity that's in the high 60s and low 70s. And uh, you can see that as these storms went ripping through this area, many of them were producing these high reflectivity values. Just take a look, though, at the cluster right here in central Nebraska and the outflow that went back toward the north and west uh, behind these storms. That just tells me the strength of the downdraft of these storms producing such a sizable cold pool that both propagated forward and backwards indicates just how powerful they were. Also, the stronger the downdraft, the greater the wind damage. And certainly we saw a lot of that in here as well. This is what things look like on satellite. Now, this is just as it, uh, you know, the sun was rising early this morning, so we still have the smoke here in the upper Midwest. But I'd like to take you back and show you this. So as we play this animation, again, you can see these storms just unzipping along this frontal boundary here. Deep, uh, you know, overshooting tops, smoke to the north of it, a low curling up over parts of the Pacific Northwest. This one also produced some hail and damaging wind. And just a reminder, we've been watching carefully the heavy rainfall that has been associated with this low curling up over New England here. And this one, again, adding more rain to the already flooded uh, parts of, of, of New England. So if we look at the hail, uh, let's zoom back out on this. We can see that across the country the last three days, we have a couple of different events. This was back on the 8th. This was the hail from the 8th. A lot of isolated hail events down across the south and even some here into, into New England. But these right in through here are the newest reports from yesterday. Uh, and that was, uh, again, some of these streaks in through here putting down baseball size hail. Uh, through parts of Nebraska. I do want to point out that we also had some uh, isolated hail events in parts of like Washington State hitting some very productive agricultural regions into this area doing some damage too. When we look at uh, yesterday's storm reports though it's right now hitting 181 total reports with 166 from hail uh, but again we're just kind of keeping an eye on this particular region. Now, I wanted to put this in a con uh, context because if we look back at our hail reports so far this year, we're currently sitting right here, and that would look to be below the climatological average, which is the thick black line. But remember that you have to go back here because in 2013 and before, the criteria used to get a hail report was three quarters of an inch. And then from then going forward, it was an inch. So this uh, you know, these events here are no longer being counted. So if you look at the solid lines, you'll actually see that you could draw another climatological average probably somewhere in through here. And we are well above that because of the new reporting standards. Also, it just reminded me today, uh, thinking back throughout history of severe weather, back on July the 10th and 11th of 2011, we had a two-day uh, derecho event that came into Nebraska, hit Iowa, another one that came out of uh, North and South Dakota, coming across Minnesota and Wisconsin. That's how things shaped up on the 10th. And then going into the 11th, it continued here across the Eastern Corn Belt, getting all the way to the Mid-Atlantic. So this was one of our most expensive, um, you know, uh, derecho events in history, uh, but it, it doesn't quite compare to the one that hit Iowa in 2020 in terms of total cost, but it was a, a powerful and very impactful system that went ripping through there. And it's just a reminder that we are at that particular point in the season where we get a lot of storm systems that come out of this direction. They tend to be linear and they tend to produce a lot of straight line wind damage. And we're about to see that there's still risk of that over the next couple of days. So I do want to show you first, though, I should have the 6 a.m. report in here. There it is. This is the total rainfall that we saw over the last 72 hours. So the low curling up here into parts of the Pacific Northwest did deliver some much needed rain to certain pockets here of Oregon and Washington, getting into some pots, spots in Idaho, but Montana as well. This was back on the uh, 8th, but here are the storms just... Um, last night ripping through this area so not a lot of rainfall out of this for for a widespread area but certainly i uh, got some precip there they come down the lower mississippi river valley this was again over the weekend very very heavy rain and here's what's kind of still being picked up from the weekend rains that came through illinois and in, into indiana but just take a look at these rainfall totals as that low curled up here into new england a lot of places getting up here into this side of my color bar which is six to ten inches of rainfall so some places in here breaking records on total rainfall as we go forward, today's severe weather uh, risk region is going to stretch from Montana 
all the way through the central plains into Iowa. And we're going to just watch this frontal boundary kind of stall out in this position. And uh, we're going to watch two days of storms kind of coming off of this boundary. We have a marginal risk down here in Texas along the Gulf Coast as well. Getting into the day tomorrow, this is just a day that I'm, I'm concerned about. And the main reason for this is Illinois, this part of, well, let's go Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, into Indiana. This is the same region that saw the derecho event on June 29th. Um, we see that the models are predicting some sort of squall line coming through uh, like this, just feeding off of the boundary, but seeing a lot of unstable air to the south of that boundary, and the wind shear profile is set up for a, a linear system to roll through there. Picking out whether or not it's going to come through Missouri or Iowa or into Illinois, I still, the models have bounced around so much with the potential of this, uh, I, I don't, I couldn't tell you exactly where, but I'm going to trust the Storm Prediction Center and where they've aligned this. Again, the concern is that we have so much of Missouri right now in, in, in drought, and in deep drought, so this would be a lot of stress uh, coming into this area from the wind uh, from this next system. By the time we get into day three, which would be the 13th, just a broader area of thunderstorm risk here, a marginal risk of severe weather. But here's the setup for this whole uh, you know, three-day event. There's a ridge to the south, there's short waves running over the top, and there's a deep low that's sitting here. So these short waves just come over the top like this and they initiate the storms on a very weak frontal boundary that sits underneath this. And then they just kind of cascade into the unstable layer, which is being fed out of the Gulf of Mexico. Plus there's been moisture returned to this area in pockets over the last 10 days where they're gonna be able to recycle some of that moisture. By the way, the flow pattern you see here is gonna be around for a while. We're gonna take a look at what that means in terms of the precipitation patterns going forward. But this is from this morning's high resolution rapid refresh model. Sometimes I show you the NAM, today I'd like to show you the, the HER. And so as we play through the remainder of the day, you can see the storm clusters here. You can see them here. All right, so this is through noon today. Getting into tonight, what we're gonna have to watch is the evolution of these storms and what happens to them in the overnight on Tuesday and where they end up on Wednesday. Notice too, there are some weak monsoonal there is some weak monsoonal flow over the southwest initiating some storms, but this is not the full-blown monsoonal flow that we can get. Why is it there? Because today the ridge is placed in this area. Every time the ridge sits over Oklahoma and Texas, oh, monsoon is on. But if that ridge moves from here to here, we shut it down. So watch for that in a few moments. So this is Tuesday night getting into the overnight hours, and this is what I'm worried about. We start to see going into the overnight hours, possibly riding on top of the boundary layer, uh, the storms that are going to slide through here. And where they end up, how do they come through Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois? You're going to see new model simulations giving you a different idea. But I just want you to be aware that this corridor needs to be prepared for the possibility of just a big bow echo coming through here at some point. It's been pretty well established uh, in the forecast models that it will be there. How it will be shaped, the timing of it, I still don't know. All right. From there, though, I would like to show you the latest from the WPC. We continue to see the WPC forecasting better rains for southern Illinois into Missouri and into Kansas. This is first going to come from some strong storms in through here. This then gets over into the Ohio River Valley as well. In fact, this is the corridor through which we expect to get a lot of this thunderstorm activity. Now, a lot of this was, since this is the 0Z zero zero run, was from last night. But this is going to be the area we're going to watch most carefully. We continue to see drier north of it, and as the ridge really opens up in the west, it's going to be hotter and drier to the west as well. Let's do a little bit of model comparison here like we did last night, and let's pull this forward just going through Thursday into Friday, now into the weekend. We're going to park this out there at a one-week uh, time frame. So again, you can see the European model has been pretty consistent over its last couple of runs on where it's putting down the heaviest precipitation, very similar to the WPC um, outlook. We're drier in Texas, we're drier throughout much of the western United States, but this is the corridor that we got to watch most carefully. It is important to note that we've seen the models stay drier here as well. Okay, This has been consistent in their forecast too. This is the same forecast but put down by the GFS. If I just take you out there one week, now we can compare the two. And again, just like last night, the GFS was very aggressive on the rainfall totals here and it is much wetter than the European in that area. So just remember these colors represent wetter from the GFS, these are wetter from the European. So there's a corridor in through here where the GFS is just really laying down the rain, but the European is not fully bought into that same solution. 
What we always do though is we look at the uh, probability maps. So this is the newest update from the um, European Model Ensemble, new high resolution 101 ensemble setup. And it's got the probability over the next 10 days of grabbing an inch of rain. And all of this is being controlled by that ridge that's just opening up into this area, giving those ridge riding storm clusters better chances to survive into this region. On the drier side of this, again, this is the probability of getting less than half of an inch. We keep an eye on the Canadian Prairie. We talked a lot about that last night. And then through southern Texas, isolated storms through the four corner states, isolated storms in parts of the northwest getting into Montana, but we're drier other than that. Keep an eye on this as well. Notice just here off the Appalachian Mountains, a drier region too. Okay, overall pattern. Not a whole lot has changed in the near term. Okay, as I just play this forward, we see the same setup coming over the top like this. Our ridge opens up into California, bringing in several days of heat, but the storms just roll down this area. And I got a good question in the comments last night. Why the 588 line? Well, 588 decameters just historically is correlated to an active storm corridor. Uh, you know, with the ridge possibly opening up to over 600 decameters here, which is just enormous, what we tend to find is that you get down to about that 588 line historically, and you have just the best contrast, the strongest flow, the best initial for these storms. So it's just a, it is just um, a, a, a historical correlation. There's nothing particular about the 588 line. I want to be clear about that. That was a good question. So this is through Sunday getting into Monday. And one of the things that did change in the ensembles is that out there around July 20th, the ridge is a little flatter in the newest run. And then beyond this, the models try to back it back over the four corner states. So if you go back and watch the in-depth video last night, there's a lot about this pattern that's similar, except where this largest ridge is located. And yesterday it was a bit more like this. And so we're just seeing the models jostle this around and now they've pulled it back farther in this direction, which increases storm chances to the north of it. And that's why when we look out there at the week two, uh, you can start to see less dryness being forecast by the European model. The GFS still more you know, focused on the storm clusters and the CPC, they've kept near normal rains in this area. Where are we drier? In the west, in the south. Where we continue to see wetter conditions than average, it's going to be up the east coast as you see here. And that's reflected pretty well in all three models. Okay. From here going forward, I want to remind you of where we were a year ago. Last year, a large ridge just sat over Missouri. And as that ridge sat in Missouri, it produced incredibly hot and dry conditions. The dry conditions in southern Missouri, Arkansas, into Texas, getting to Oklahoma, this was the beginning of a major crop failure uh, here uh, due to excessive heat and very dry conditions. It hit our cotton crop very hard. And uh, this is what those temperatures look like compared to normal. If you remember, there was about a 90-day stretch in here where I think 70 of those 90 days, the temperatures were over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, this particular year, okay, this is the same stretch of days. Uh, we've not seen that. That heat has stayed pretty far to the south, and it's about to open up over the four corner states. So what a dramatic difference for part of the country when you compare it to just one year ago, uh, looking at these temperature ranks. So where's our greatest risk of heat today? Well, it's down here in Texas in the Red River. It's moving into the southwest and into California, where there are excessive heat watches and warnings in place. Those daily high temperatures, let's take a look here. This is today's high temperatures getting into tomorrow. A lot of heat right here in the parts of uh, Missouri. And remember, this is out ahead of where the frontal boundary is going to kick off those severe storms. So we just need to watch in this area for the destabilization of the atmosphere. But a lot of hundreds down here to the south, a lot of heat into New England. But that doesn't last long north, okay? This whole region starts to cool off by Thursday into Friday. Getting into Saturday, the heat just pours into the western United States, triple digits easily throughout California's Central Valley. That lasts into Sunday and Monday. So what's going on here? We have this large ridge that's opening, deeper trough that's over the Hudson, cooler air in between. But the heat backs up with the ridge. In fact, that's why the ridge exists. Stretching it out a bit farther, this is that five-day sliding window of average temperature anomalies. Let's take it out there today, five through 10. Because the models have kept the ridge now farther to the west, you'll notice day 10 through 15, California doesn't get the same level of cool off that it did in yesterday's model runs. But we are very concerned that by the end of the month, we're going to open up a lot of the United States to above average temperatures uh, with a big you know, ridge developing here. You'll get storms running around the periphery of this, but that's, that's the setup.
Nothing to be watching right now in the tropics, so we're not going to give you, uh, you know, nothing to be updated about that. But I think our biggest risk is going to be where the high heat is going to be. So again, looking at the Climate Prediction Center's update, this is where they've got the risk of excessive heat. If you got another 30 seconds, I would like to bring you up to speed on a couple of international things. Models actually trended drier in some of China's key growing areas here. Um, yesterday, you know, I was talking about looking at the NDVI data, showing there were some problems compared to last year. Well, we had a bit of a drier turn on some key acres in this area. Indonesia is still wet. Isolated storms through Europe, but a lot of dryness here. The wetter conditions are in northern Europe. Um, other than that, same setup for South America that we talked about, and we're just keeping an eye on, um, on storm clusters coming off of Africa for the next, really about the next 100 days in through here. And finally, temperatures. So there is this heat wave coming into south central parts of, of Europe. Um, other than that, you can kind of just get a quick look around the rest of the world as to what's going on with the temperature pattern. So keep you updated and talk to you again in the morning. Thanks.